Welcome to the Chronic Pelvic Pain and Pelvic Floor Myalgia Lecture. My name is Dr. Maria Giroux. I'm an obstetrics and gynecology resident interested in urogynecology. This lecture was created with Dr. Rashmi Bragava and Dr. Husei Kamensik, who are gynecologists, and Suzanne Funk, a pelvic floor physiotherapist in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. We designed a multidisciplinary training program for teaching the assessment of the pelvic floor musculature to identify a possible muscular cause or contribution to chronic pelvic pain and provide early referral for appropriate treatment. We then performed a randomized trial to compare the effectiveness of hands-on versus video-based training methods. The results of this research study will be presented at the IUGS Ayuga Joint Scientific Meeting in Nashville in September of 2019. We found that both hands-on and video-based training methods are effective. There was no difference in the degree of improvement in assessment scores between the two methods. Participants found the training program to be useful for clinical practice. For both versions, we have designed a guide to the assessment of the pelvic floor musculature, which are cards with the anatomy of the pelvic floor and step-by-step -step instructions of how to perform the assessment. In this lecture, we present the video-based training program. We have also created a workshop for the hands-on version. For more information about our research and workshop, please visit the website below. This lecture is designed for residents, fellows, general gynecologists, urogynecologists, and allied health professionals. The objectives of this lecture include to identify pelvic floor myalgia as a possible cause or contributor to chronic pelvic pain, to recognize that patients with pelvic floor myalgia may present with urological, gynecological, and or colorectal symptoms, to explain the importance of incorporating a musculoskeletal examination of the pelvic floor into the physical examination for patients presenting with chronic pelvic pain, and to describe the steps of a comprehensive musculoskeletal examination of the pelvic floor. There are no conflicts of interest to disclose. Chronic pelvic pain is a complex, multifaceted problem that places a substantial burden on the healthcare resources. It is common and affects women of all ages and backgrounds. 10 to 15% of gynecological consultations are for chronic pelvic pain, and 15 to 20% of women have chronic pelvic pain lasting for more than one year. The cause of pelvic pain is unknown in 61% of these patients. Chronic pelvic pain may arise from gynecological, urological, gastrointestinal, and musculoskeletal systems. It is often associated with lower urinary tract symptoms, or LUTs. Pelvic floor myalgia is a common condition encountered in general gynecology and urogynecology, but it is frequently unrecognized and undertreated component of chronic pelvic pain. A 2013 large retrospective cross-sectional study by Adam Sital examined patients who were referred to a urogynecologist for an assessment of various pelvic floor conditions. These included pelvic organ prolapse, urinary incontinence, overactive bladder, recurrent cystitis, interstitial cystitis, and pelvic pain. 24% of the 5,618 patients referred to a community-based urogynecology practice were found to have pelvic floor myalgia on physical examination. Pelvic floor myalgia is an important contributor to chronic pelvic pain. In a 2011 prospective cross-sectional study by Fitzgerald et al., 63% of patients with self-reported chronic pelvic pain examined by a physician and 73.7% .7 of patients examined by a physiotherapist were found to have pelvic floor myalgia. Pelvic floor myalgia has a significant impact on the patient's quality of life. Patients with pelvic floor myalgia score 50% higher on the PFDI, or Pelvic Floor Distress Inventory, and PFIQ, or Pelvic Floor Impact Questionnaire, compared to patients without pelvic floor myalgia. A 2011 literature review of 69 articles by Cavadius et al. revealed that fewer gynecologists perform the assessment of the pelvic floor musculature for the presence of myofascial pelvic pain and trigger points. It is important for gynecologists to examine the pelvic floor musculature not only for strength, but also for a possible muscular cause or contribution to chronic pelvic pain. Failure of gynecologists to examine the musculoskeletal component and refer patients for appropriate treatment may result in persistent symptoms, subsequent patient visits to numerous healthcare providers, and unnecessary laparoscopic surgery. Persistent chronic pain may result in patients' anxiety, low mood, depression, sleep disturbances, feeling of hopelessness and helplessness, frustration, psychological distress, and impaired quality of life. This training program consists of three parts. The first part presents an overview of chronic pelvic pain. The second part presents an overview of pelvic floor myalgia. The third part is a teaching demonstration of a comprehensive assessment of the pelvic floor musculature taught by a physiotherapist.
We will first begin with a general overview of chronic pelvic pain. The International Association for the Study of Pain defines pain as a subjective experience that is described as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage, or described in terms of such damage. Chronic pelvic pain is defined as either persistent pain for at least six months or recurrent episodes of abdominal or pelvic pain, hypersensitivity or discomfort, often associated with elimination changes and sexual dysfunction without an organic etiology. The 2014 European Association of Urology Guidelines on Chronic Pelvic Pain define chronic pelvic pain syndrome as persistent pain that is perceived in the structures related to the pelvis in the absence of proven infection or other obvious local pathology that may account for the pain. The Chronic Pelvic Pain Working Group of the International Content Society published a report in August of 2016 describing a standard of terminology in chronic pelvic pain syndromes. This is the first report produced by the ICS that presents global standardization of terminology and outlines clear definitions. Prior to this report, the terminology used in chronic pelvic pain was poorly defined. This report presents the preferred terms and definitions for signs, symptoms, and diagnostic workup for patients presenting with chronic pelvic pain syndromes. Chronic pelvic pain is a multi-system disorder. Symptoms may arise from gynecologic, gastrointestinal, urologic, neurologic, musculoskeletal, and endocrine systems. Chronic pelvic pain is also affected by psychologic and behavioral factors. The Chronic Pelvic Pain Working Group of the International Content Society defined nine domains that are involved in chronic pelvic pain syndromes, eight of which pertain to female patients. When assessing a patient with chronic pelvic pain, it is important to consider the lower urinary tract, female genital, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, neurological, psychological, and sexual domains, as well as comorbidities. Chronic pelvic pain may arise from the lower urinary tract, which includes bladder and urethra. Patients may present with urinary urgency, increased day or nighttime frequency, pain and pressure with filling, hesitancy, intermittent voiding, and feeling of incomplete emptying. Pain may be due to interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome, interstitial cystitis with Hunter lesions, hypersensitivities bladder syndromes, and urethral pain. The female genital domain includes pain that originates from the external genital organs, vagina, intraabdominal structures, and pelvic floor muscles. Patients may present with dysmenorrhea, abnormal uterine bleeding, dyspareunia, vaginal discharge, burning, itching, or stabbing pain, pain with voiding or defecation, and abdominal or pelvic pain. Pain may be unilateral or bilateral, constant, intermittent, or cyclic. Pain may originate from the vulva, clitoris, vestibule, labia, introitus, or vagina. Pain may also originate from the pelvic organs, intra-abdominal adhesions, or may be due to pelvic congestion syndrome. Pelvic floor muscle pain is also an important origin of chronic pelvic pain. It is also important to consider sexual pain, which will be discussed further in the sexual aspects domain. The gastrointestinal domain includes pain originating from the anorectum and colorectum. Patients may present with constipation, diarrhea, pain and or bleeding with defecation, recurrent rectal pain, pressure or burning sensation, discharge, and cramping abdominal pain. Pain originating from the anorectum may be due to chronic proctalgia, proctalgia fugax, pelvic myalgia, anal fissure, anal abscess, or hemorrhoids. Pain originating from the colorectum may be due to functional gastrointestinal disorders, such as the irritable bowel syndrome. Pain may be also due to inflammatory bowel disease. The musculoskeletal domain includes pain originating from the pelvic floor muscles, fascia, pelvic joints, ligaments, and bones. Pelvic floor myalgia is pain in the muscles of the pelvic floor, which include levator and eye muscles. Intrapelvic muscle pain is pain originating from pelvic sidewall muscles, which include obturator internus and piriformis muscles. Anterior pelvic or lower abdominal muscle pain is pain below the umbilicus originating from the rectus abdominis, external and internal abdominal oblique, and transverse abdominis muscles. Posterior pelvic or buttock muscle pain is pain originating from the gluteal muscles. Coccyx pain syndrome refers to pain originating from the coccyx or sacrococcygeal joint. Pain may also originate from the pelvic joints, which include the sacroiliac joint or SI joint, pubic symphysis joint, as well as joints of the lumbar spine and hip. Ligaments may also produce pelvic pain. These include the sacrospinous ligament and the sacrotuberous ligament. 
Bony pain may be present along the margins of the pubic ramus, ilium, ischial spines, or ischial tuberosity. The neurological domain includes pain due to complex regional pain syndrome, somatic neuropathic pain, and pain following mesh surgery. Patients may present with burning, throbbing, or stabbing pain, electric shock-like sensation, stinging, or paresthesias in the pelvis and or perineum. Somatic neuropathic pain may be due to a disease with sacral nerves or thoracocolumnar nerves. Sacral nerve disease includes pudendal neuralgia. Thoracocolumbar nerve disease includes disease of the ilia inguinal, iliac hypogastric, femoral, or obturator nerves. The psychological domain is very important when assessing chronic pelvic pain, since pain is affected by cognitive factors, emotional experiences, memory, and attention. This domain includes worry, anxiety, and fear, depression and depressed mood, and catastrophizing. Patients may present with low mood, anxiety, worry, frustration, sleep disturbances, feeling of hopelessness or helplessness, difficulty concentrating, and pain impairing the enjoyment of daily activities. Patients with chronic pelvic pain may have a negative affective, cognitive, and psychological state. Patients may interpret pain as a signal that something is wrong in their body and may develop anxiety. Without a clear explanation for pain, their anxiety may persist and patients may avoid activities which exacerbate their pain. Patients may also develop low mood and depression due to pain or not being able to perform daily activities of living. They may feel hopeless and helpless about finding a solution for their chronic pain and living an enjoyable life. Persistent pain may result in psychological distress, which may result in catastrophizing, which is a tendency to overestimate the magnitude of the experience of pain and underestimate the capacity to deal with the pain. Sexual function is often affected in patients with chronic pelvic pain. Patients may have a sexual desire disorder, which includes hypoactive sexual desire disorder and sexual aversion disorder. They may also have sexual arousal disorder, orgasmic disorder, and sexual pain disorder. Patients may present with low libido, inability to become aroused, dyspareunia, and difficulty reaching an orgasm. Furthermore, more than 50% of patients' partners also develop sexual dysfunction. Patients with chronic pelvic pain, especially those with interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome, have a higher prevalence of comorbidities than the general population. Chronic pelvic pain may coexist with allergies, chronic pain and fatigue syndromes, systemic autoimmune diseases, and extraintestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease. Chronic pain and fatigue syndromes include fibromyalgia, temporomandibular joint disorders, and chronic fatigue syndrome. Systemic autoimmune diseases include lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, and rheumatoid arthritis. Patients may also have extraintestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease, such as sacroiliitis. Patients with chronic pelvic pain are also at risk of narcotic pain medication dependence. Let's now focus on one of the causes and contributors to chronic pelvic pain, which is pelvic chlormyalgia. The International Urogynecological Association and International Content Society Joint Report, published in February of 2017, defines pelvic fomyalgia as pain in the musculature of the pelvic floor. Pelvic fomyalgia has also been referred to in literature as pelvic floor muscle pain syndrome, pelvic floor tension myalgia, levator myalgia, and levator NI syndrome. It is common for patients with chronic pelvic pain to have pelvic fomyalgia. Pelvic fibromyalgia may be present alone or may coexist with other gynecological, urological, colorectal, and musculoskeletal medical conditions. Chronic pelvic pain may be due to dysfunction in the pelvic floor muscles, abdominal muscles, nerves, ligaments, or tendons. Nonetheless, it is important to rule out any medical pathology. When discussing pelvic fibromyalgia, it is important to define muscle tone, hypertonicity, and spasm. Muscle tone is the resting tension of the muscle, which can be determined on the physical exam as a resistance to passive movement. Normal pelvic floor muscles have a constant symmetrical resting tone. They are able to contract and relax. Pelvic floor myalgia may or may not be present together with a change in the tone of the pelvic floor muscles. Hypertonicity is defined as an elevated muscle tone. It is associated with an increase in contractile activity and or passive stiffness of the muscle. Stiffness is defined as resistance to deformation. In contrast to hypertonicity, a spasm is a continuous contraction of a striated muscle that cannot be relaxed voluntarily.
Spasms may lead to contractures, which is an involuntary shortening of a muscle. Myofascial pain syndrome is the most common medical condition in the general population. It is present in 65% of adult population between the ages of 30 and 60, and 85% of the patients older than 65 years of age. The International Urogynecological Association and International Content Society Joint Report defines myofascial pelvic pain as pain caused by the presence of trigger points in the pelvic floor muscles or their fascia. Myofascial pelvic pain is a common contributor to chronic pelvic pain. 74% of patients with chronic pelvic pain were found to have abdominal wall trigger points, and 71% had trigger points in the levator ani, obturator internus, or piriformis muscles. Trigger points may be present in muscles of the pelvic floor as well as the abdominal, gluteal, iliopsoas, and other muscles. A myofascial trigger point is a tender, taut band of muscle that can be painful spontaneously or when stimulated. Points are caused by an acute muscle trauma or repetitive microtrauma. The tissue surrounding trigger points often has impaired circulation and autonomic disturbances, such as pilar erection or goosebumps. Trigger points can be palpated during a physical examination and produce pain when the muscle is compressed or stretched. There are two types of trigger points, active and latent. Active trigger points produce localized pain and referred pain. Pain may be constant or intermittent, vague or sharp. Rectal and clitoral pain is often sharp, whereas vaginal and troidal pain often has a burning quality. Latent trigger points do not produce pain and can remain dormant for years. This makes identifying etiology challenging. Trigger points can be activated by even a seemingly insignificant exacerbating physical and emotional stressors. Muscles that have trigger points are often weak and stiff. Trigger points prevent the muscles from fully lengthening and restrict the range of motion. Movements that require for the shortened muscle to stretch result in pain. Patients may complain of pain with certain postures and activities, such as voiding, defecation, and intercourse. Pain from trigger points can be aggravated by menses, prolonged standing or sitting, certain activities, intercourse, defecation, and alleviated by certain positions. Trigger points can develop in any of the muscles of the pelvic floor. The referred pain does not follow a dermatomal distribution. However, characteristic referral patterns have been documented in literature. For a table of referred pain patterns, please see the 2012 article by Bastor et al. Pain from trigger points in the pelvic floor muscles may be referred to the perineum, vagina, urethra, rectum, abdomen, back, thorax, hips, buttocks, and the lower leg. It is common for pain to be referred to the lower abdomen, resulting in possible confusion between musculoskeletal, gynecological, and gastrointestinal causes of pain. Chronic pelvic pain may also arise from trigger points in the abdomen, hip, and thigh. Trigger points as far as supraspinatus and infraspinatus were found to contribute to chronic pelvic pain, interstitial cystitis, and voiding dysfunction. Pelvic myalgia often develops over a protracted period of time and has multiple possible causes. Pelvic myalgia may be due to musculoskeletal or postural issues, such as impaired biomechanics of the lower extremities, unequal weight bearing, muscular strain or sprain, scoliosis, hip osteoarthritis, SI joint dysfunction, spindulosis, and congenital malformations of the sacrum or pelvic floor. Unequal weight bearing can place stress on the abdominal muscles and pelvic floor muscles, resulting in hypertonicity and pain in the abdominal and pelvic muscles. The 2008 study by Montenegro et al. found that 85% of chronic pelvic pain patients have postural changes contributing to chronic pelvic pain. Pelvic floor myalgia may also be due to injury to the pelvic floor such as pelvic floor strains and sprains, falls during childhood, childbirth, pelvic surgery, post trauma, sexual abuse, and repetitive straining from constipation. Hypertonic pelvic floor after sexual abuse acts as a psychological defense mechanism against unwanted vaginal penetration. It may also develop secondary to inflammatory conditions such as irritable bowel syndrome, endometriosis, and interstitial cystitis. Lifestyle-related causes include repetitive use or underuse, prolonged standing or sitting, frequent wearing of high heels, and ergonomic stressors where chronic overload of the pelvic floor muscles results in activation of trigger points. Another lifestyle-related cause is postponing micturition and defecation, which requires contraction of the pelvic floor. These conditions can result in muscle strain on formation of trigger points. 
Trigger points can continue to be a source of peripheral pain, thus contributing to central sensitization and resulting in lower pain threshold. Patients with pelvic floor myalgia may present with urological, gynecological, and colorectal symptoms. The severity and perpetuation of these symptoms may vary depending on the patient's menstrual cycle, emotional state, anxiety, amount of sleep, prolonged sitting or standing, bowel movements, physical activity, sexual activity, and nutritional state. Severity of these symptoms may vary throughout the menstrual cycle due to hormonal influences on the muscles, ligaments, and joints in the pelvis. Normally, the pelvic floor muscles provide postural support during physical activity and relax during urination, defecation, and intercourse. Hypertonic pelvic floor muscles do not relax appropriately. Patients may present with symptoms of dysuria, urinary frequency and urgency, delayed voiding, impaired defecation, sensation of incomplete evacuation of bowel or bladder, and dyspareunia. Urgency may be due to trigger points in the levator ani, obturator internus, and rectus abdominis muscles, or spasm in the sphincter urethrae and compressor urethrae muscles. Difficulties with defecation may be due to acute anal rectal angle due to the shortening of puborectalis muscle. Furthermore, patients with trigger points often have nutritional deficiencies in vitamin B1, B6, B12, folic acid, vitamin C and D, iron, magnesium, and zinc. 90% of patients have insufficient vitamin D levels and 16% have insufficient vitamin B12 levels. In order to understand why patients with chronic pelvic pain often present with multiple symptoms from multiple organ systems, it is important to understand the interrelationship between the muscles of the pelvic floor and visceral organs. At the level of the spinal cord, the efferent nerves from the somatic structures, which include the pelvic floor muscles, converge with the efferent nerves from the visceral structures, which include bladder, vagina, cervix, uterus, proximal urethra, and the internal anorectal area. This convergence is necessary for the normal regulation of the bladder, bowel, and sexual functions. Normally, the impulse travels from the muscle via efferent nerve fibers to the spinal cord and then to the thalamus. However, it is possible for the impulse to propagate in the reverse direction. This is called antidromic propagation. This impulse travels to visceral organs via visceral efferent nerve fibers and causes for inflammatory mediators to be released into visceral organs, resulting in symptoms. Therefore, muscular dysfunction can result in disease of the visceral organs. The reverse can also occur where the impulse from visceral organs travels to the somatic structures that share the same dermatome as the visceral organ. Therefore, disease of the visceral organs can create muscular dysfunction. Furthermore, pathology in one visceral organ can result in pathology in another visceral organ. In the somatovisceral convergence, hyperactive muscles or trigger points cause neurogenic inflammation in the visceral organs, resulting in visceral dysfunction. Damage to the motor end plate of muscle fibers results in release of acetylcholine and formation of trigger points. Trigger points result in local ischemia, decrease in pH, and activation of local muscle nociceptors. Noxious signals are then transmitted from muscles to the spinal cord via somatic afferent nerve fibers. A pathologic antidromic signal is then sent back to visceral organs via visceral afferent nerve fibers. Inflammatory mediators are released into the visceral organs, resulting in neurogenic inflammation of visceral structures. As a result, patients may experience diffuse abdominal pain, bowel, bladder, and sexual dysfunction. Urgency and frequency that are encountered in urogynecological practice may be due to pelvic chlomyalgia or myofascial pelvic pain. A 2007 prospective cohort study by Peters et al. demonstrated that 94.2% of patients with interstitial cystitis had levator ni pain, and a 2008 prospective cohort study by Seath and Teachman found that 94-96% to of patients with interstitial cystitis had bladder neck tenderness. Therefore, pelvic floor dysfunction can result in neurogenic inflammation in the bladder in patients with interstitial cystitis. In the viscerosomatic convergence, inflammation of the visceral organs result in antidromic signals sent to the skeletal muscle, resulting in neurogenic inflammation in the skeletal muscle. Muscular dysfunction is characterized by muscular inflammation, hyperalgesia, formation of the myofascial trigger points, hypertonicity, and decreased muscle strength. Persistent nociceptive stimulus from visceral or myofascial sources can evolve into a pathological central sensitized state, which contributes to the severity and duration of chronic pelvic pain. Central sensitization is a state of generalized or widespread hypersensitivity. 
Patients with persistent pelvic pain experience adaptive changes in their central nervous system to protect against the threat of potential future damage, which is determined by the patient's beliefs and fears. As a result, there are changes in the morphology and function of the brain and spinal cord. These changes result in incorrect processing of afferent information by increasing activation and decreasing deactivation of pain-related areas in the brain. This results in altered perception of pain. Patients may experience allodynia, or painful perception to a non-painful stimulus, and hyperalgesia, or exaggerated and prolonged response to a painful stimulus. There is increased pain responsiveness to mechanical pressure and chemical substances, stress, emotions, mental load, cold, and heat. This may also result in expansion of receptive fields, where widespread changes in pain perception occur and the source of pain is perceived to be originating from structures that do not have pathology. This occurs when the efferent nerve fibers from the original noxious stimulus synapse in the spinal cord with nerve fibers from segments above, below, and contralaterally. Central sensitization may present as multiple coexisting centrally driven pain conditions. These conditions are characterized by multifocal pain, fatigue, memory difficulties, insomnia, and comorbid mood disorders. These medical conditions include pelvic floor myalgia, myofascial pain syndrome, regional soft tissue pain syndrome, chronic pelvic pain, interstitial cystitis, vestibulodynia, vulvodynia, endometriosis and primary dysmenorrhea, irritable bowel syndrome and other functional gastrointestinal disorders, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, temporomandibular joint disorder, restless leg syndrome and periodic limb movements, idiopathic low back pain, headaches and migraines, and multiple chemical sensitivity. When assessing chronic pelvic pain, it is important to consider the biopsychosocial model. The biopsychosocial model was developed by Engel in 1977 and can be applied to chronic pelvic pain. The experience of pain is influenced by biological, psychological, and social factors. Biological factors include genetics, molecular changes in the body systems, and nutrition. These include changes in the gynecologic, urinary, gastrointestinal, nervous, endocrine, and muscular systems. Psychological factors include mood, emotions, and behaviors. This includes anxiety, low mood, depression, sleep disturbances, feelings of hopelessness and helplessness, coping mechanisms such as alcohol use, fear avoidance, and psychological distress. Patients may have negative thoughts of mistakenly believing that symptoms are in their head or that they're not getting well. Social factors include interactions with others, culture and cultural taboos, religion, and social economic status. This includes loneliness, lack of participation in daily activities, unemployment, and poverty. Therefore, when assessing a patient with chronic pelvic pain, it is important to also consider all factors that influence the perception of pain and to discuss the patient's thoughts, beliefs, fears, and expectations. Although pelvic chlormyalgia is a common contributor to chronic pelvic pain, a comprehensive musculoskeletal examination of the pelvic floor is rarely routinely performed. Palpation remains the best method of assessment for pelvic chlormyalgia. It is important for gynecologists to perform a simple musculoskeletal screen along with a pelvic floor muscle assessment in an attempt to reproduce patient symptoms. A positive exam warrants an early referral to a physiotherapist who has experience in treating pelvic floor disorders in order to avoid pathologic progression into central sensitization. Aside from assessing the pelvic floor musculature, physiotherapists also typically perform a biomechanical assessment to assess spine, pelvis, and hips. The following muscles are important for the assessment. Obturator internus and piriformis muscles are the muscles of the pelvic sidewall. Obturator internus originates from the inferior margin of the superior pubic ramus, passes through the lesser sciatic foramen, and inserts into the greater trochanter of the femur. Piriformis muscle originates from the anterior lateral aspect of the sacrum and the sacred tuberous ligament and inserts into the greater trochanter of the femur. Both of these muscles laterally rotate an extended hip joint and abduct a flexed hip. The pelvic floor consists of levator ani and coccygeus muscles. It stretches like a hammock from the pubic bone to the coccyx and attaches to the pelvic sidewalls via arcus tendineus levator ani fascia. Levator NA muscles include puborectalis, pubococcygeus, and iliococcygeus. They originate from the inferior pubic cremi, arcosyndineus levator NA fascia, and the ischial spine. They insert into the central tendon of the perineum, the wall of the anal canal, anococcygeal ligament, coccyx, and the vaginal wall.
They provide support to the posterior wall of the vagina, assist the interior abdominal wall muscles, assist in defecation, and maintain fecal continence. They also have a role during childbirth, and they support the fetal head during cervical dilatation. Puborectalis muscle originates from the posterior inferior pubic crami and arcus tendineus levator ani fascia. It forms a sling around vagina, rectum, and perineal body and produces the anal rectal angle. The anal rectal angle is thought to contribute to fecal continence. Coccygeus muscle originates from the ischial spine and sacrospinous ligament. It overlays the sacrospinous ligament and inserts into the lateral margin of fifth sacral vertebra and coccyx. Its action is to support the coccyx and pull the coccyx interiorly. The muscles of the superficial perineal compartment include ischial cavernosus, bulbal cavernosus, and superficial transverse perineal muscles. The superficial perineal compartment is located between the superficial perineal fascia and the perineal membrane. Ischial cavernosus originates from the ischial tuberosity and ramus and inserts into the crus of clitoris. It is innervated by the pudendal nerve. It moves blood from the crura into the body of the erect clitoris. Bulbal cavernosus originates from the perineal body and inserts into the bulb of vestibule, perineal membrane, body of clitoris, and corpus cavernosum. It compresses the vestibular bulb and dorsal vein of the clitoris. Superficial transverse perineal muscle originates at the ischial tuberosity and ramus and inserts into the perineal body. It stabilizes the perineal body. Perineal body is a connective tissue structure that acts as a point of convergence of bulbal cavernosus muscle, superficial and deep transverse perineal muscles, external anal sphincter, perineal membrane, and posterior vaginal muscularis. It also acts as a point of insertion for puborectalis and pubococcygeus muscles. The external anal sphincter is a striated muscle that encircles the anus. It functions together with puborectalis and the internal anal sphincter muscles to control fecal continence and defecation. We will now present a teaching demonstration of a comprehensive assessment of the pelvic floor musculature taught by pelvic floor physiotherapist Suzanne Funk. This teaching is also available as a hands-on workshop. We'd like to extend a special thank you to the Delary Simulation Center at the Regina General Hospital for providing the pelvic model. We'd also like to thank Marie-José Forget, a physiotherapist, for permission to use the pelvic floor model. The purpose of today's exam is we have a client that's presented with pelvic pain. So what we're going to do is observe and, and do an external examination, but also an internal examination to try to determine the source of that pain. So in the context of this assessment, what we're going to be doing is checking for muscle tone, whether it's high tone or low tone. We're going to check the muscle strength. We're also going to check for pain or reactivity of those muscles. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to do a full assessment, as we said, externally um, and internally, uh, vaginally and rectally, usually for these clients, depending on the complaints that they're coming in with. One of the teaching tools that I use is this, basically it's a paper diagram that was created by uh, Marie-Josée Forget. It's great for a good reference point for us, as well as using as a teaching tool for the clients. It is not uncommon that I will actually give this to the client while I'm doing the assessment. Um, I obviously orient them to it, and then they're holding on to it while I'm actually doing the assessment so they can follow along. It's really good for their anxiety, it keeps them occupied, and plus they're actually, they get to see what we're actually doing in there. Now, for our purposes, um, we're going to use it today because as I'm teaching you which muscles to assess and, and what we're assessing, we're going to follow along with the diagram. So just to orient ourselves here, this is obviously um, a female diagram. We've got the vagina at the rectum, the coccyx at the bottom, the pubic ramus at the top, um, and then we've got the ischial spine here. Uh, the muscles that we'll be looking at mostly will be um, pubovaginalis, Coming around here, around the vagina, puborectalis, going down like a horseshoe, down through um, around the rectum, pubococcygeus, attaching to the coccyx, is iliococcygeus, ischiococcygeus, even we assess piriformis, as well as obturator internus, which we are um, assessing quite often as well. Um, obturator internus, just to remind you guys, we have this other model here, it's this one. So if you look at the pelvic floor, here's these guys, the puborectalis and ischio, um, or iliococcygeus and ischiococcygeus, but over here, this is obturator internus. And he is the one, or that's the one that comes around with the tendon around the uh, ischial tuberosities and attaches onto the hip bone. So it's an external rotator of the hip.
If we flip this, this um, model around, you can see externally what we can also palpate, so externally on the, on the uh, client. So we've got ischiocavernosis, which just goes along there, along the pubic ramus, bulbo, uh, cavernosis, uh, the external anal sphincter, and super, superficial transverse perineus, which are coming together and converging at the perineal body. So we can use that as well. So we'll be using this while we do the examination. While I'm uh, demonstrating on the model, we'll be going back and forth between this and this model, showing you kind of where, what position my fingers are in, and then most likely, you know, whether you're at the third or first or second or third knuckle, which muscles and how, what angle you're at to palpate different ones internally. So during this pelvic floor assessment, we will also be assessing pelvic floor strength. Um, and when we do, we're going to be using the traditional scale of zero to five. Now we're going to move on to the external assessment of this client who's presenting with pelvic pain. We just start with a visual. So we're just going to take a look at what we at what we see here. So the first thing that I tend to, to look at first is I'm just getting a general read for um, any trophic changes, meaning, you know, can we see what, what's the color like? Is it gray? Is it still, is it pink? Um, what's the hair look like in the area? Is it starting to thin or is it still relatively coarse? Um, we're also going to take a look at uh, any uh, signs of rash or irritation in the area. I would often, um, later, I would often just separate the labia to be able to look even between labia majora and labia minora. But even just externally, you can sometimes get a sense uh, if it's looking a little bit red or if there is, um, like I said, a bit of a rash. Um, we're also looking for... Um, signs of tone even like the labia themselves and um, when the tone is still preserved and there's very little trophic changes they'll still be quite plump um, as opposed to um, when we have hormonal changes as we age then those labias tend to recede back a little bit and and in all fairness can tend to look a little bit wrinkly that would be suggestive that we're having some trophic changes there we would also externally palpate just for sensation so i always tell the client before I'm going to do anything, especially, I mean, we should be doing this anyways, but anybody that is suffering from pelvic pain, we don't have a, any idea yet of, her, of their level of sensitivity. So I just start in an area that would be non-threatening. So the buttock cheeks, I'll just say, I'm gonna use the back of my two fingers. I'm just gonna press against the left butt cheek. I wait for them to say yes. They're like, yeah, okay, so I'm just gonna press. And I'm asking them, does that feel um, okay? Does that feel normal? And I'm, I'm looking to see whether they're gonna say that it's very painful or if it um, feels um, any other kind of sensations. Uh, and then I just palpate on the right side and then I'll say left labia and I'll go up there and then right labia. And then often I tell them as well, I'm gonna check between the wind and the rain, so just between the vagina and the anus, and I'm just palpating there in the region of the perineal body just to see what their sensations like. Once we've done that, I will often move on to um, assessing just externally um, two reflexes, the bubble cavernosum reflex at the clitoris, which what we do is we just gently, very gently, I will slide back the clitoral hood, and then I will just gently give it a little flick, and you'll often see it just retreat. When I'm doing that as well, what I'm actually also checking is just for the mobility of that clitoral, clitoral hood. Sometimes it's tethered a little bit and won't draw back, and if that was the case, that may be due to high tone or some connective tissue adhesions there, but um, we don't see it very often, but, but we're assessing for that too when we're checking that. Then I would just ask, I would just ask them if it's okay if I just separate the buttock cheeks and then I very lightly, and I tell them ahead, I'm just going to just lightly stroke on the, the external anal sphincter and you just stroke it and again you'll see it kind of recoil and draw in a bit. That's just those reflexes. So now we're going to move on to assessing the musculature that we can actually assess externally. So we're still not going internally with this examination. And again, just to remind ourselves, we're assessing for tone, um, high tone or low tone, and again for strength. So the ability of those muscles to contract in addition to pain. Okay, so externally, if we go back to this model, this paper model that we have, we can um, assess ischiocavernosis. So he's right up there along the pubic ramus. So you're actually going, so you can palpate 
for the pubic ramus and then you just come in you're kind of it's like you're curling in just right on the bone you do not have to palpate very deeply and you'll be able to feel the muscle and you can actually ask them to do a bit of a contraction and it's not a big contraction but you'll feel it not even necessarily flicker but it actually you'll feel it tense up underneath your fingers and then same thing you can do it on the other side just palpating along the bone I would often go around and actually do it on the other side but sometimes I just stay in this position this is what's really important to have short fingernails when you're doing these assessments but you just come in again along the edge and go in a bit and then ask them to contract again we're also assessing for pain when we're doing this and asking them at all times okay so that's ischiocavernosis we can also assess bobo cavernosis so Right, it's, it's under labia majora. So you palpate in until you're up, just as deep, deep into the labia majora. And then again, number one, asking them if it's painful. You're feeling for whether or not you feel high tone. Is it really rigid or is it firm or is it quite soft? If you just go in, you'll get up against the edge of the bone there. And then just feeling, ask them to contract and to do a Kegel or do a... Uh, and we, we tend to say Kegels, it's really just a pelvic floor contraction, but lots of patients understand the word Kegel, and then they'll do their contraction. You're just palpating to feel if you can actually feel that contraction. And then you can do the same thing on their left side. Superficial transverse perineus is another one. He's just going from the ischial tuberosities over to that perineal body. So I like to landmark, I, I will usually actually do the perineal body. So he's right at the center of everything. And it's rather firm because you can see where they're all converging into the center. So you just palpate right there. Again, palpating for tone, asking them if it's painful or what they feel. And then you can just, so that would be the perineal body, and then you can just follow along and go towards, because you can feel where in the butt cheek where the, where the ischial tuberosity is, and you palpate in there. And you'll actually feel, and then ask them to contract, and you can feel it tense up under the fingers. And assessing it before just for the tone. And again, on their left-hand side, doing the same thing, pressing in, just feeling for tone. Does it feel firm to the touch? Does it feel soft? and then asking them to do a contraction. You're right there and you can slide back over to that perineal body and then even palpate there, asking them to do the contraction, seeing if you can feel it pushing against your fingers, if there's any movement at all. And then the external anal sphincter. Usually you do have to separate the buttock cheeks and then just palpating along the sphincter. And I will often palpate around it. So I won't just assume that I'm on one side, that that's indicative of a good contraction around. So first I'm checking for tone, so I'll just palpate around it. it, it the minute you touch an external anal sphincter, often you will get a bit of reactive spasm. That is absolutely normal. It's just a reflex of guarding response. But then if you just palpate for the tone and then ask them to do a contraction, and again, you'll feel them tense up under the fingers, and I usually just go around it gently and just asking them to contract. So now we're going to move on to the internal examination at the vaginal region. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to gently separate the labia, obviously telling the client that I'm going to do that. So we just separate labia majora. A little bit difficult on this on the sim model here but what we would do normally those wouldn't recoil back and first we're just looking to see whether there's any prolapse so we're looking for prolapse of bladder prolapse of cervix prolapse of, of rectum you look when the patient is sitting and at rest is comfortable and then what I usually ask the client to do is to prop themselves up on their elbows so that they're forward slightly and then I do actually ask them to cough when they cough again I'm looking to see do any of those structures descend from when they're in supine and at rest to when they add the cough. And then accordingly, depending on which grading system you use, um, you would grade accordingly. Okay. Once that's done, then we do move on to the internal examination of the muscles. Again, just to remind ourselves, we are looking for tone in these muscles and we are also looking for pain and we are also then going to grade strength. Again, just gently separating the labia, assessing yourself level of the tone just so that you know whether you're using a single digit or bivanual exam. We're going to insert and we're going to use this model here as well. So first I'm going to check for pubo vaginalis. So pubo vaginalis, just to remind ourselves, he's attached um, up at the pubic ramus, coming down, going around the vagina. So he's basically, the, this is the muscle that is the first one inside. 
So you can have your fingers, I'm just really basically to my first knuckle, and if I turn left or right at the three o'clock and the nine o'clock position, you'll very easily be able to palpate that muscle. You're palpating for tone, does it feel rigid and hard, or is it feeling basically soft? We're also checking just at the opening, just even just basic elasticity. So feeling whether that's rigid or, or if, it's, if it's not rigid, does it, if I can press against it, does it recoil fairly easily? Okay. The next one there, if we just move systematically in through um, as we insert, the next one's going to be pubo rectalis coming around and going around. Um, again, inserting an anterior um, or the pubic ramus coming around and inserting again at the top, going around the rectum. So again, I can really just come in, but I'm going up here because I'm coming in vaginally, going laterally, and again, I'm really at that second knuckle. Really hard to tell whether I'm actually on pubovaginalis or rectalis, but I'm right there. And again, just assessing for tone. At this point, it's more important that we're feeling whether it feels hypertonic or not. A hypertonic muscle, for those of you who aren't sure what that means, it's a muscle that's basically tensed. So it's like when you contract your bicep muscle, you can feel the muscle get hard versus when it's relaxed, it would just feel like bread dough. It'd be really super soft, okay? The next muscle we would be able to palpate if we just move more laterally will be pubococcygeus. So doing the exact same thing that we did with the other two. I'm just palpating. I'm lightly just going with my fingers. So I'm not pressing hard even. I'm pressing in to see what that tone is. I'm feeling how soft the muscle is. So now we're going to move on to iliococcygeus because he's the, the next one in line here. You're inserting in, you're going about to your second knuckle, so again, you're going to be right over, uh, so you'll be able to reach that one or very easily. So I'm in, and I'm lightly just palpating that muscle to determine whether I'm actually on that one or not because it, it's kind of difficult, but a really way, easy way to tell. Have them do a bit of a light pelvic floor contraction. If they do their traditional kind of Kegel exercise, you'll feel it pel uh, tense up right underneath your fingers, and you're on it. Okay, in that position as well, maybe um, inserting just a little bit further, so I'm maybe like between my second and my third knuckle there, coming in through the vagina. Now we're going to come in and go in and get into obturator internus. Okay, so again, so now I'm coming in a little bit further. I'm reaching around because I'm trying to get down into there a little bit. On this one, the way that you know for sure you're on the obturator internus is because it generally rotates that hip. When they're up in the flex position, if you have their knee would be right about here. If you just apply pressure externally on the knee and ask them to push out towards you, you will feel obturator internus tense up right underneath your fingers, and then you'll know that you're on it. Okay. So that's a really good way to tell. Then we've just got ischiococcygeus. The way to find it, or the best way, is it would go back to midline. I would insert up to about the third knuckle, get way into the back so that you're actually palpating the tip of the coccyx. And then just move your, so come off the, rise up on that coccyx so that you can feel it. Go off to the side and you're on ischiococcygeus. So my hand is quite a ways in and then I'm I'm going down towards the right butt cheek, and I'll feel that one. Again, I'm assessing for tone. Is it firm? Is it soft? Is it painful? Okay, we would do all of those, just warning the patient first that we're going to turn our fingers, and then doing the same thing on the opposite side as well, going through all of those muscles. Okay, if you want to assess strength, you just ask the patient to do a pelvic floor contraction. If they're not sure, then maybe you can cue them by saying something like if you zip closed and then zip up, that often lets people know what they need to do. Um, and at the same time, you're feeling with your fingers to be able to assess that grade from zero to five. Zero being no palpable contraction at all and grade five out of five is full strength. Now we're gonna assess a couple of more things, but they require that we stand during this part of the assessment. So the first one we're gonna do is piriformis, commonly involved in people that are experiencing pelvic pain because it's attached to the SI joint and we commonly have dysfunction with that when we have pelvic pain. In order to assess it, we're gonna be very similar position that we were when we were trying to palpate ischiococcygeus. But when we come up, we're not just going onto the tip of the coccyx or onto the coccyx. We're going to go more cranially onto the sacrum. I'm going to ask the client to actually bring their knee up towards their chest so they're holding it up. And I go laterally on the sacrum and up, and then you'll be able to palpate piriformis. Again, you would do it on the left or on the right side or whichever side you're on, and then go over to the other side. 
Then what I also do, there's another grouping of muscles, so anterior levator ani. So it is the muscles, if we go back to this model here, these, a lot of these muscles are all converging up top here at the back of the pubic ramus, and that's our pubic um, rectalis and uh, coccygeus and vaginalis are all coming up there. So they make up the anterior levator ani. You're going to have to warn the client that you're going to turn your hand because your knuckles are going to be turning here a bit. Sometimes I have to come out a bit. Sometimes I stay right where I am, depending on the client and their level of uh, discomfort or sensitivity. So what we do is we actually just turn, rotate the fingers. So now they're going to be turned upward. And I am going to straddle the urethra. So you do not want to be on it. You want to be on either side on the muscles because you can see on the model here how they're actually on either side of that urethra. So I'm going to palpate this. Now, why do we even, why are we concerned about this? If you have high tone in anterior levator ani, chances are the person may be complaining of urgency. So expect that when you go to palpate this, so I'm just taking my fingers out, I'm not palpating that hard, I'm actually just touching first. They will often usually, if this is a problem, they will complain of urgency when we do that. So I will hold that and then I'm going to actually stretch the uracus ligament. So you find the pubic ramus and you're going to go onto the skin surface, you're going to depress on a uracus ligament that is not tense, um, that it's fully flexible, I would be able to push in perhaps even up to two to three centimeters, like you can squish in quite far on one that's very tense and irritated. When I go in, it, I'll barely be able to even depress the tissue and they will immediately be reporting that they have increased urgency. Okay, and if we find that, then that obviously we're going to use and that's going to be something that we're going to treat um, and release those areas. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the rectal portion of the examination. The reason that we would even do this is some um, clients are complaining purely of pain in the rectal region, so we need to get a really good idea about, again, the tone, whether it's high tone or low tone, and even the strength in that area, and of course their level of pain, or if it even is painful. So the first thing that we would do is we would just separate the butt cheeks just lightly there, and then you're just going to lay your finger just on the external um, anal sphincter. We do not want to force this. One of the ways that I found that works really easy, uh, and it's a lot more comfortable for the client, is I just place my finger there, and then I just ask them to breathe. As they breathe, because when they breathe in, the pelvic diaphragm is going to lower, they actually almost move on to my finger. If I keep my finger there just, just sitting, and so as they breathe, it almost draws my finger in, so I just gently go with the breath. Once we're in just a little bit, so I may be like halfway into my first um, phal phalanx there, I can already assess the tone in external anal sphincter. Um, Basically, in a hypertonic external anal sphincter, it will feel like it's almost cutting off the circulation in your finger when you're doing it. It can be that tense. So it's normal to have a bit of tone, but if it's feeling uncomfortable for you, chances are it's a hypertonic external anal sphincter. So we insert a little bit further, and we get, you'll have to go to your first knuckle, and then you can feel, you'll be able to move your finger, and you would actually be on pubo, rectalis. So my knuckle is sitting at the external anal sphincter, but the fat pad of my index finger is, if I go like this and go down, I'm right on puborectalis. Okay? Now, you can assess tone that way, so feel whether it feels firm, whether it feels soft. If you wanted to, you could assess their strength and have them do a bit of contraction. Feel if you can feel them uh, lift up against your finger. But an even better, or another thing to assess, we're going to insert a little bit further again, and we're actually going to assess the, the anal rectal angle. So you come in, your finger is going to be following the rectum, and you're assessing for the angle there. If you have a hypertonic puborectalis, so this muscle, and if it is pulling up then, on that rectum, if it's hypertonic, your angle will usually be less than 90 degrees, a normal tone is usually your finger will sit at 90, so you can get an assessment of tone without actually necessarily feeling the muscle, just assessing that angle. Um, in that position as well, you can assess the same muscles that you assessed vaginally. We can do ischiococcygeus again easily by inserting a little bit further, being able to palpate the end of the coccyx, getting onto the body of that coccyx, moving laterally to do your ischiococcygeus. 
um, and coming back a little bit to the tip of the coccyx and being able to assess pubococcygeus, palpating it for any tone, abnormal tone, um, as well as pain. And if you want to assess each mus muscle individually, you can have them contract and just be palpating. Not that they can activate the muscles separately, but by you having palpating the muscles, you would be able to tell which ones are activating and which ones aren't and assess their strength individually. And that basically is the majority of the assessment for uh, rectally. When I go to remove my finger, I'm always telling them as well, and I get them to breathe as well when they do that. And again, removing my finger as they're breathing in, sometimes it may take a few breaths so that they're comfortable with it, and then you're done. To conclude, chronic pelvic pain is a complex multifactorial issue that requires a multidisciplinary approach. Pelvic floor myalgia is an important and common contributor to chronic pelvic pain that may be present alone or may coexist with other medical conditions. Patients with pelvic floor myalgia may present with urological, gynecological, and or colorectal symptoms. It is important for gynecologists to recognize the contribution of pelvic floor myalgia to chronic pelvic pain and to incorporate a musculoskeletal examination of the pelvic floor into their physical examination for patients presenting with chronic pelvic pain. Thank you.